Volume 5 C16. Ileana looked around when she landed, she was immediately filled with anxiety when she fell into a heap on the floor and found that Albedo had not followed behind her. Relief however, was not long in coming. No sooner had she managed to get up on all fours, than she heard the calm and stately steps of her lady walking past her. Lady Albedo. Where are we? Ileana asked. Kalincha. An important city in the Holy Kingdom's northern half. Albedo answered, I have business here. Business? Ileana asked, her head afog at the idea of a demon doing business of any sort. Albedo only made a cryptic smile down at her servant. Yes, the Robley Holy Kingdom is going to be dearly in need of outside help soon, and when they are, you will see the one I love, in all his greatness and glory. I am eager for the day, Lady Albedo, Ileana whispered with reverence. She got up and moved behind the demon woman, how may I serve you in the meantime? Albedo pointed to a pile of documents which sat seemingly waiting for her on a nearby dark wooden desk. Sort through everything, search for any hint of anything useful. Any disturbances, any problems I might exploit. Ileana bowed deeply at the waist, my lady, I obey. She took her short, scurrying steps over to the desk, yanked the chair back, sat down, and began to read through the stack. Albedo, for her part, sat at a table and waited while doppelgangers periodically entered the room to provide personal information on their progress. Ileana paid close attention with one long sharp ear while her eyes went from item to item until something of merit caught her attention. Lady Albedo, here is something, she said and stood up from where she sat. She approached the demon, knelt, and held the document out to her. A squire, a scout working in the wildlands, charged with treason and collaboration. Albedo took the document and asked, why is this important? My lady, her father is of the nine colors, even I've heard of Pable, and her mother is a paladin too. They are of low ranking but, thanks to her father, a well-known noble house. The details of why she is charged. Perhaps something can be done with that? Ileana's tone was speculative at best, but as Albedo read it over she glanced up, go retrieve me something to drink, I'll read through the rest of it. As you command. Ileana answered, Albedo crossed her legs and let one arm drape over the back of her chair while resting her other arm on the table and reading through the document. Having a personal secretary is going to be a good idea after all. She didn't really pay any attention to the elf woman's departure, instead she focused on the information provided. Ileana had good instincts, it seemed. I can blow this quite out of proportion, oh you unfortunate Nyabaraha. Blessed are you who may serve the Supreme Being with your life. Albedo wore a pleasant smile on her face that remained there still when Eliana returned, my lady. The elf said and knelt and held up the tray with a porcelain white pitcher and a silver goblet of deep red wine. The guardian overseer took the cup and drank half of it in a single long draught. Eliana stood up and moved to her lady's side. Was I useful, my lady? Eliana asked. Albedo answered immediately, yes, very much so. That squire might be just what I need. I am mildly curious if she is guilty though. I'm not, my lady. She is a human, I have no doubt that she would have tormented me like all the rest. She's guilty of being human, that is guilt enough to deserve to die. Ileana replied with a silken vitriol. Perhaps, but you're right, it doesn't really matter whether she did anything against the law or the nation. It only matters what we can make people think and how I will use that to draw my beloved into my arms to tell me how proud he is of all my hard work, Albedo said and held out her cup. Ileana held the tray with one hand under the center, picked up the pitcher, and poured another cup. Yes, Lady Albedo. She answered with devotion and smiled contentedly as her lady drank, the memory of the burning city still lingering behind happy elven eyes. The memory lingered every day and night for weeks, as the long work went on. Pable sat outside the cell where his daughter was confined, he was seated on the floor, largely because she was as well. A half-rotted old wooden chair sat neglected a few feet away, and Nia listened to the rough-hewn man with rapt attention. The trial will begin tomorrow, our. Our request for clemency was declined. Her Majesty will not hear the case herself, and you're to be tried by a group of lesser nobles and a minority of soldiers from the Order. Pable explained, but his wavering face bucked up into a smile. On the good side though, evidently you've built up quite a reputation, for weeks since word of the accusations against you began, stories about your exploits have been everywhere. 
Pabel held a hand through the bars, and Naya took it in both of her own, her fingers rubbing around his warm skin. Dad, I'm not famous, or at least, I haven't done anything I deserve to be called famous for. Naya denied it, but then cocked her head, what are they saying? That you beat a frost dragon in single combat and forced it to serve you. That you were using a dragon to help protect the worlds and keep demi-humans out of a broader stretch than any lone scout has done for a hundred years. That your reputation is so widespread among the demi-humans that many refuse to come south until you die. Pable couldn't keep the broad smile of parental pride off of his face as he recounted those and other stories that Naya knew were absurd on their face. Dad, I didn't beat the dragon, he landed here already wounded, I was just taking care of him. Naya shook her head, how ridiculous can stories get? She asked herself, and answered, very, in her head, a moment later. So where is mom? Why isn't she here today? Naya asked, changing the subject. She is. Being herself, Pable said with a sigh and slumped forward a little while still holding his daughter's hand. You know her temper. Yes. I know, Naya said, unable to look at him for a moment. Don't be like that, she only wanted what was best. She just had a hard time saying it. Pable offered the gentle rebuke to his daughter, but tightened the grip of his hand with a little squeeze. I can only be like me. And I know what you're saying, I know it now. But she's liable to cause more trouble. You know how stubborn she gets when an idea settles in her head. Naya answered her father, and he laughed. She reminds me of someone I know. Pable laughed in spite of the stone and the bars, and Naya flushed red as she realized he meant her. I guess. Naya reluctantly acknowledged. She then took a deep breath and let her father's hand slip from hers as she withdrew a little beyond his reach. Dad, listen, I want you to do something for me. I want you to take mom, take mom and go. I know what I asked you before. But forget that. Whoever is supposed to scout the wildlands is probably dead by now anyway, offered to go check on them, asked for a few days away. I don't want you two here for this. I refuse. Pable answered immediately. You're my daughter, I left you alone too many times when you were growing up, I wasn't the best father, even though I wanted to be. But I won't fail you now. Naya cracked a little smile while she struggled to keep back tears. You're a better father than I knew, there's no talking you into leaving me now, is there? No, no of course not. She answered her own question. Don't worry, I'll do my best when the time comes. Go on, get some rest, I'll do the same. See you tomorrow, Naya said and ended their time together. When she stood up, so did he, they embraced through the bars, she breathed in the scent of oiled armor, soap, and linen, then on tiptoe. She kissed his brown bearded cheek, and let go. They parted in silence then, the door clinking shut just as Naya lay down on the straw again and pulled the moldy blanket over her to try to sleep for at least a little while before her final battle. Volume 5 C-17 Kanka sat alone with Kellett in the private council chamber. The rectangular table had enough room for ten, but holding only the two of them, they sat close by each other, with Kalko at the head and Kellett at her right hand. It's things like this that make people think we're having an affair. Kellett thought, but didn't really care. Perverts see sex everywhere, even where it isn't. She idly twirled a brown lock of hair around her finger as she tried to stay focused. The radiant Holy Queen smiled encouragingly and sat with her back straight and regal. Go on, you were saying, Kellett? Her lilting voice like a soft caress between them. Kellett cleared her throat, coughing into her hand, yes, yes of course. Your Majesty, we've prosecuted 14 judges for corruption, and 75 guards for extortion. And that is just this week alone, but most of the accused are acquitted. Not all, but most. The Holy Queen's smiling face became deeply unhappy, so many. How can the corruption be so thick as that? It's worse, Kellett said, you asked for the good news first, my Queen, that was the good news. The bad news is that a meteor shower hit the city of Wenmark. Most of the city's important people were killed, roughly two-thirds of the city collapsed or burned, and the prison and slave population have escaped. According to this, they're marauding all over the region, destroying mining communities and more. The southern nobles are withholding taxes to pay to put them down, and we can't pay for everything we need in the north without their support. Kalka's frown became deeply saddened, so many people. And now bandits on top of it all? Dispatch food aid and some of the reserve raw materials south, 
but do it with an escort of a thousand paladins. There to send the taxes back, but also to help hunt down the prisoners that have gone so wild. We cannot have a perfect kingdom with bandits and corruption, she declared with a small fist slamming on the stone table at which they sat. Kellett bit her lower lip for a moment, I know, Majesty, I know. But we also can't have one while we're short of funds, and we can augment those funds if we take a harder stance, here in the north. A harder stance? Kalkar asked, her brow furrowed and her little fist relaxed, she took a deep breath, you're talking about Emperor Jertniv's methods, aren't you? A purge, yes. Kellett answered, we know who is guilty, but they buy their way out of guilt with money they got in bribes, theft, or worse. We've had a dozen murders in Hobans itself, each of those arrested said some form of, and I quote one of them completely, there's no justice for me unless I take it. Kalka's body shuddered. Anarchy, that way lies anarchy. A all right. Send soldiers south and recall Remedios to Hobans. I will let her carry it out. Kellett went very quiet. My queen, I love my sister, but she is. Well she's stupid. Kellett, Kalka exclaimed, her eyes flew wide at the blunt insult. Kellett hung her head for a moment, her hands fell in her lap, she is. I'm sorry, your majesty, but while she is zealous, strong, and incorruptible, she has the brain of a hamster that has taken one too many blows to the head. If you set her to this, she'll do it. All she needs to know is that it is your justice, and she'll carry it out, that is how much she believes in you. Are you saying it's foolish to believe in me? Kalkar asked, unsure if she should feel hurt, insulted, or outraged. Kellett leaned forward and slid her hands over the table to touch the fingers of her queen. She said in an almost desperate urgent voice, No, never. I wouldn't be here if that were the case, but she'll go too far and never realize it. She can't be trusted to act on her own. Kalka closed her vibrant blue eyes, let out a snort and gave an affirming nod as she came to a conclusion. She won't be. You can control her, can't you? Kalka asked rhetorically, it wasn't really a question. Yes. Kellett answered the question regardless of whether it needed to be or not. I will. I will go personally. Then go, and may the gods favor you, Kalka said, and Kellett stood up to bow with deep reverence for her treasured queen. Till my return, she said, and departed, leaving Kalka alone with her hopes. Olisar Dark lay in one of the many low valleys of the hill region, well out of sight of any paladins. The orcs were serving as his eyes and ears in the south. Presently, an orc youth knelt before him, barely above child age, some of the young adults were volunteers in waiting and watching the distant wall. Many had a first-hand experience with the mad-eyed archer, and the dragon suspected some volunteered just to get a glimpse of a memory in the present. My lord, the orc said, seen nothing on the wall, but the human outriders who come out of the stone to trade, we speak to them. They tell things they know. What do they say? Olisa Dark asked his tail undulating behind him while he listened to the little green creature, his head moving ever closer so that his eye was near its body. They trade little stories, gossip and stuff but the trials morrow. The young orc explained, but this left the frost dragon with questions. They are your enemies, but you. Speak with them? He asked, unable to keep the sliver of doubt from his voice in the form of a low growl. Sorta. The orc scratched its butt and tried to think of how to answer. They got outriders, come check things by and the wall, little trade, stuff hard to get, see what's going on out here. They're not friends but. We trade stories. Learn a bit, us close to the wall try and warn them about anything real big happen here and in us change they don't come out and tag us. It made a sort of sense. Humans, as near as he could tell, had no history of invading the Abelian Hills, but the reverse wasn't the case. It stood to reason that the humans would have a group that goes out past the walls if they would keep scouts in the wildlands as a precaution against small groups. Do you know how long their trials last? Olisar Dark asked. The little orc frowned and shook his head, not a no idea. Then watch the wall, orc. Olisar Dark gave the order, and the orc stood up. Yes sir, ah, also, the stone spitter chief wants to see you, okay? The orc asked. And Olisar Dark nodded, send them to me. Volume 5 C18. Albedo sat luxuriating in the cart beside her elven servant. Today she wore a blue and white shirt to show the colors of the Holy Roble Kingdom, 
with a flowing ribbon design around her breasts to accentuate and entice, while her smaller servant was clad in men's travel clothing of black and green pants. Ileana picked them as she drove the horse cart full of supplies to be sold in the fortress city at the wall. You will be surrounded by humans, Ileana, Albedo cautioned the slender elf, but you belong to a superior demon, do not forget that. The disguised succubus remarked while looking down beside her wagon driver. I will not, Lady Albedo. The elf woman said in a quiet voice. Humans are the real demons, she said in a quiet whisper. Albedo didn't bother with that, the fortress was coming into view. It was far from the only such installation, but it was the largest and the strongest. The road was broad and meant for the marching of an army, the cart they drove was not the only one going to off from the place, but of the ones that did, almost all were marked with the official emblem of the Holy Kingdom, and almost all were driven by armored soldiers. The fortress stabbed defiantly at the distant sky with its great towers, like many spears of stone that dared the gods on high to strike down those who lived below. The trees were far more abundant than Eliana expected along the roadway, and the birds that chirped both in and out of view were numerous. For a moment it was like being home again. She could have been a farmer again, taking her goods to market. If it were not for the thick bearded humans, she could have fully immersed herself in the illusion. They took no real notice of her though they turned up their noses whenever she caught sight of them looking at her ears. Still, Ileana kept her jaw clenched and hatred quiet as the fortress and the wall loomed ever larger and they drew ever closer. Her breathing quickened when the halberd-bearing human approached from the gate and addressed the soft-faced albedo, ironically her training in the brothel made her so excellent an actress that she was able to disguise it with a bored expression, tired from a long stretch as if the journey had been far longer than it actually was. The approaching soldier brought his halberd to a guard position and looked up at the women travelers. Papers? He asked, and Albedo reached into her pocket to remove the trade authorization procured from a doppelganger who seduced the merchant guild leader. The guard unrolled the paper, looked it over, and nodded. The papers rustled as he re-rolled them and extended his hand back up to Albedo with the long end of the documents out. She took it and put it into the pouch at her side, what are you selling? He asked his halberd relaxed with the butt on the ground rather than at the ready for use. If you're selling that, he pointed at Ileana, we don't allow non-humans here, too dangerous. Ileana flinched where she sat, but said nothing and averted her eyes from the human. No. Albedo took it in stride and jerked her thumb over her shoulder, beer from the kingdom of Nazarick, as well as jerked meat, rice, wheat, and a handful of imported tools we had left over from our last stop. I have a use for this one. She pinched Ileana's ear, so she is not for sale. Ileana whimpered a bit at the sudden pinch, but otherwise kept her peace. The soldier smacked his lips. Beer, you say? I do say. Albedo winked down at him, they're getting quite a reputation for beer quality now that they've started setting up national breweries, since the Allfather is the only one who is licensed to produce or sell it. Quality control is key, it's a matter of national pride. Trust me, you'll love it. Ah, well. Well, go on then, he said, his face split into all smiles and the portcullis came up again. Follow the path till you get to the merchant area, show them your papers, they let you set up a booth, tent, or what have you, but no permanent structures. Temporary only. Understood, soldier. Albedo replied with a friendly smile that sent a flutter through his heart while she imagined tearing it from his chest. The chains clinked and the smell of oil and bodies that could have stood to be washed more often, reached their noses. The smell of horses and unwashed dogs, as well as the manure of both, became more common too, and both Albedo and Eliana wrinkled their noses at that. The hustle and bustle of the fortress was like any city Eliana had ever seen, except for one difference. Nearly everybody was uniformed, and there were relatively few women. Tabards of the Holy Kingdom, flags, and painted shields were everywhere. Even workers who didn't have armor on were dressed in a practical uniform fashion of forest shades that would be useful if they had to flee into the woods. Crates of supplies moved and columns of soldiers marched over hard-packed earth. She found the area he meant, it had a few dozen tents in various shades, most put up signs to indicate what they were selling. They were simple things, an anvil for someone with metal goods, and for additional guidance, they had a small rack with various tools in place and even a sharpening wheel. Albedo watched a soldier hand the merchant a copper coin and a sword, immediately the broad-shouldered metal merchant got to work sharpening it for him. 
a few tents over, a sign that was nothing but a wooden board with a pair of crudely painted breasts on the front said all it needed to. But if it hadn't, a pair of women dressed in Holy Kingdom tabards, sandals, and nothing else, beckoned with come hither looks, sultry smiles in order to entice customers to their wares. Ileana made a point of not letting her eyes linger on that scene as a soldier undid his belt before he was in the tent and followed an auburn-haired woman into the tent. At another tent there were various sweets on display, a matronly older woman held them up and shouted that they were ready, behind her, a grey beard was busy stirring a stew pot and shouting, stew in a minute, try the wife's goods while I get ready. In front of them all stood a spindly looking fellow who stood so stiff and rigid that Albedo had to wonder, is he capable of unclenching his ass enough to take a shit? He held an official looking clipboard and flicked a thin moustache at a wayward fly as if he had a cat's whiskers on his callow face. Albedo dismounted from the cart when she came close to where he stood with a bored face that bordered on frowning and discontentment. She approached, her feet kicking up a little dust that didn't rise above the ankles of her knee-high boots, she yanked the document from her pouch and stuck it out to him in a no-nonsense fashion. My papers. She didn't smile at this one, and he didn't look at her, he only took the document, unrolled it, put it on his clipboard, stamped it, and handed it back to her. Set up next to the whores and remember there's a tax on leaving here with unsold goods, so don't do it, he said while pointing toward the prostitutes. One of them began to play a lyre, and the other began to dance, her garments were of peasant origin, but had clearly been cut and modified for a different kind of practical application. A crowd began to gather to watch the performance. I don't think that will be a problem, but, what is the tax if we did? Albedo asked with a cock-eyed look. The unsold goods, he said bluntly and then went back to looking past her as if she weren't there. I didn't realize my corruption efforts had been that successful, there's no way that is a real tax. She half laughed but pretended to frown at what he said and got back into her cart. Drive, she said to Ileana who cracked the reins and the cart wheeled over to the nearest place staked off by the whores. Get the bar ready. Albedo gave the perfunctory order and got in the back of the cart to relax while Eliana dragged the barrels over with steady grunts until they were at the edge of the back with their spigots facing out. The whore finished dancing with the dying music and watched the pair work. Hey, you're not whores are you? Because it's not fair if you got to sell beer too. Albedo glared at the green-eyed woman, no, she said with an icy stare, there's only one man I desire, anything less than he is unworthy. Mind your business insect. The auburn-haired woman was nonplussed. I was just being friendly. You sell beer, we sell. Other refreshments, the two go together really well, nothing better than what you've got before they have what we've got. The woman laughed with glee as if she'd said something very funny, but it had Albedo's attention in a far more serious fashion. Something Ileana had said about wine to set the mood. She glanced at the former elven prostitute and asked, Is that whore there? She pointed at the bold dancer woman who picked up a painted wooden sword and began to twirl with it like she was the whirlwind, casting her hair and arms about when the music picked up again, correct? Sort of, my lady, but she put it a little crudely, I can explain it better when we have more time, if it pleases you, Ileana said as she began to unload crates to create a ring between the beer supply and where her customers would order. Hey! The auburn-haired girl tossed the phony sword into the air, tilted her head up and caught the edge in her teeth without slowing her spin. She stopped only slowly, allowing the sword to fall from her teeth and into her waiting hand as her legs swept out behind her. My name, lady, isn't that whore. My name is Skana, and I only do this for fun when I've run out of the rest of my produce to sell. Albedo snorted. Whore, Skana, it's all the same to me. The auburn-haired girl shrugged. Prudes, go figure, she mumbled and gave a sultry smile at a passing soldier forgetting the offensive merchant and going back to the business of pleasure. Volume 5 C-19 Albedo tended the improvised bar with a welcoming smile on her face. The bar such as it was, was composed of crates and barrels with a simple flat board on top of it at each of three sides. At her back, Ileana attended to protecting the money and quickly washing out wooden steins and cups for reuse. Attempting to use her for all tasks proved too great a burden. Using her at the bar proved that the humans on the border would not respect an elf. So Albedo calmly slid a big mug over the wood to the latest customer and asked, So are you going to watch the trial? I can't believe how secretive everything has been, it's like they're trying to hide something, she said and unleashed her pheromones against the utterly defenseless male. 
The unwashed soldier in the off-white tabard in front of his armor frowned a little, you think? Sure, a single soldier puts down a dragon, befriends it, can you imagine how helpful that would be in protecting the border from the dummy humans? But you know who doesn't get credit? The Holy Queen, the Paladin Commander, the nobles. Think about how corrupt things have been lately. Do you really think it's a coincidence that the Baraha girl, a member of an important noble house, is on trial at the same time as all the other things going on? It's a plot, Albedo rested her chin on her hand and her elbow on the bar. Don't you think? She asked. It's such a shame nobody will do anything about this, they'd rather you die by the thousand rather than give someone else the credit for anything. Albedo empathized with the scruffy-looking paladin, he took up his mug with a troubled expression on his face and mumbled something incomprehensible before he walked away. Behind her, Ileana quietly marked another line on an unlabeled wooden board. The soldier downed his mug and started chatting with three others served several minutes earlier. Albedo's sharp demon ears caught every word, and what she heard made the smile on her face quite genuine. The ladies got a point. A big trial for the Mad Eye Duchess' successor, a dragon tamer no less, right at a time when there are allegations of corruption in the government itself? Come on, she's being set up. Lust and alcohol addled minds conjured up stories of their own, and the dragon taming daughter of the Mad Eye Archer had her legend grow with every cup. And it continued each night as those chosen for the trial came in. Albedo exploited it to the fullest. As soon as the first of the nobles came in with their array of retainers and tag along, she and Eliana were prepared. Her pheromones lured men and women alike, and within an hour she was posting a sign. Reserved for nobles from sundown to gloaming, with their fine steeds and vibrant themes of blue and white clothing, all of which had some variation of the national symbol and their family crests prominently emblazoned on their expensive silks and linens, they were the picture of privilege and status. Their retainers walked with the confident swagger of those who knew that their service to the powerful bought them license to act out. They were the young, the arrogant, the proud, the destined for greatness, and despite the divide of both species and origin, Ileana and Albedo found common ground in their mutual loathing for the lords, ladies, and their retainers. But they were useful. Ileana worked quietly out of view, for good measure and extra protection for herself. She hid her ears by wearing a scarlet scarf that held them tightly against her head and layered so that the outline of her ears would not be visible and so not to create instant hostility toward her presence. Albedo however, pressed the point home. She made a show of her swagger and swaying hips, casting favorable glances at the nobles and laying down frothing mugs while giving pitying eyes to those who eagerly waited in the wings for the chance to give her their hard-earned money. And when the nobles finally filtered away to avoid socializing with common soldiers, she put a soft-looking hand on the few crates she set up as seating areas and said to each one, Forgive me, but the lords and ladies here to judge one of your fellows demanded primacy for themselves. It's so unfair, you do the fighting and the dying, like that lone paladin in the wilderness, and yet you cannot even drink until darkness because they don't want to see you. Strange that they're also the ones to judge you. She made it rankle day after day. Night. After. Night. Naya had no idea how much time really passed for her within the isolated cell, though her father came for her frequently, and her mother came almost as often, all she could do with herself was wait. The chains on her wrists chaffed, her hair became bedraggled. Naya lowered her nose toward her armpit and took a sniff. She smelled. That's not good. My nose should be dead to the smell of my own body, and if I can smell myself, I probably reeked to the heights of heaven. As it couldn't be helped, she simply waited. The clinking of the door was the only thing that made her shift her gaze from the blank rough wall and over to the string of bars between her and the promise of liberty. Her knees pulled up to her chest, Naya's mind turned toward her patient, if Olyser Dark died then I'm sure somebody would have told me. She reached down to the bread in the bowl of water and took a bite of the soggy black stuff. It was flavorless stuff not meant to be enjoyed, just to delay starvation. She chewed a little and let it slide down her throat just as her visitor came into view. Hello, traitor. Rema Dios was glaring down at her with a face filled with hatred and loathing. Her smooth and youthful face was marred by the upturned sneer. I'm not a traitor, or a collaborator, Naya spat back and gave a long steady look at her orders commander. You helped a dragon, you spared the lives of dummy humans. That's evil. Remedios said and put a hand on one of the bars, she squeezed the iron enough that it began to bend inward under the grip of her fingers. 
Did they offer you gold, silver, or were you so easily bought that you did it for coppers? Remedios asked. Naya looked at her former superior and gave her a slow shake of her head, but said nothing. Someone like you, would never understand. Now what do you want, Remedios? To watch you hang. That's why I'm here, to collect you for your trial. Stand up. Remedios gave the order and Naya slowly followed it. She stretched when she was on her feet, letting out a satisfied groan when the chain swayed over her head when she put her hands up high and arched her back. You came yourself, not the guards? Remedios showed no pleasure at the passive observation. Just get out here. She gave the brusque command and waited while Naya obeyed, approaching the door when Remedios opened it up. Vicious little bitch. The paladin orders commander muttered and put her sword to Naya's back as soon as the squire stepped through the opening and faced the exit. Let's get this over with, Naya spat onto the stone and walked toward the exit of the prison. When she did, it was to sights and sounds unimaginable to her. The fortress city was like a single living organism. And yet now it was silent as if the whole place had simply died. Lining walls, rooftops and what passed for streets, the greatest bulwark against the demi-human invasion was packed with people, and yet Naya's sharpened senses barely detected a cough. If this is how it's to be, then so be it. Naya told herself, straightened her back, and strode with steady, military steps over first the stone, and then the hard-packed earth. The shame of her shoeless feet, the pathetic prisoner sack that served as her garment marked to identify her as a captive, she wore her naked skin and rough sack-like badges of honor. I've looked worse in the wilds, she told herself, and kept her eyes forward as full-plate armored soldiers fell in at Remedios Custodio's back and their halberds came down on either side with tips to her throat so that even one hesitant step would bring blood into the air. Albedo watched with smug satisfaction as all her rumor-mongering and skills turned a better-than-average huntress of the wilds into a legend that needed the tightest security to guard against. She looks the part, I'll give her that much. Naya walked without missing a second, her chains rattled as she moved, and when she came closer to the place of trial, where she could see the stand where she was to be secured, with iron bars affixed to heavy stone, itself set tightly into the ground, a double box of wooden seats where the nobles and a few soldiers stood waiting for the judge, it was, in a word, ominous. Or should have been. But her heartbeat was steady, I was never going to have a quiet end. Naya told herself and smiled though I didn't think my last battle would be one quite like this, it could be worse. She would have shrugged, but chose instead to keep her shoulders squared while the drums began to play her approach and summon the judge into position. When she reached the place she was to stand, a shaky-handed guard whose armor clinked with his nerves, secured her pliant and relaxed hands to the iron crossbar that would keep her from escaping, and to Naya's surprise, Gustav Montagne approached and stood behind the judge's podium. Remedios, for her part, stood directly behind Naya with her sword out and the tip pressed against the prisoner's back. The trial of Naya Braha, will now begin. The judge called out, and the drums ceased to beat, restoring silence until he said, let the prosecutor begin the questioning.